What is up, down, and sideways, you lovely individuals? We are back. It's Liga and Mark here, and Mark here with you, beauties, for now a post esports World Cup. We're gonna listen. People are taking way too much from this tournament, so we're just kind of going. What is something you learned from all the teams that went through this? Because again, this is a strange in the middle tournament where we kind of have to gauge how much value are you actually putting and taking away from this event well, i'll save you and i'll give you a little analogy thinking you're hungry for lunch you want to eat a big old meal you said give me the full foot long sandwich you're getting a tea sandwich you're getting one of those small little dainty slices of sand yeah exactly that's what you get away from this event but nonetheless it's something to eat is the way that you have to look at this and for some of these teams and getting a little bit of uh, foreign cuisine, if you will, getting to try out and sample into the other regions as well is an important thing to check in with these teams. But you're right. I think a lot of people are kind of coming away from this, hoping for that full meal, that full entree to discuss and to have the feelings about their team and where they're going from here. But at the end of the day, I think you need to check it. You need to check against some of the facts about what's going on with this event, the preparation, all those things in hand and where you can actually take these results as. So what one thing you can learn from each team, basically, you know, we start, this is the MSI rematch, basically, these eight squads, and we start with, of course, the team that won the whole thing. Say what you will about this tournament, but T1 saw World Cup. They just saw World, they said, oh, it's World we gotta activate, and that's exactly what you learned throughout this run for T1, is that they're still capable of reaching that world's level form. And truthfully, the form we saw throughout this event, we haven't seen much of in the LCK yet. I didn't know world's level form required fearless draft coming through from Guma Yushi through this event. Not imposed for the event. Just my man feeling, feeling the- His the teammates were stealing all his AD carry picks from him. That's the other thing as well. I'm rocking it up into the top side, a couple of different options. One of the things I think you saw here from T1 for sure, as we've talked about, is whether we were going to get the T1 that was at that world's quality. I, that's not the takeaway from here, but part of that world's quality was having control, was having your own meta that you could dictate, that you could bring into series and say, this is how we're going to play. Yes, you have the meta considerations, but you got to consider what we are also rolling as the hot hand. That's going to be the thing. This is a T1 that looked in that type of control of the meta, of pick and ban in that situation throughout this uh, event. Yeah, I mean, the 380 carry comps, uh, and then specifically, obviously, Curious Bard is something you can highlight throughout this in terms of, yeah, influencing these kind of pocket pick champions. I know Zeri is not a pocket pick, but Zeri top is a little bit spicier than what we're accustomed to seeing out of her, even though Zeus throughout this tournament I uh, didn't look that comfortable on it and somehow looked less comfortable when he was playing Cassante. Uh, yeah, th that was one of the things I think you're going to have to look at this one and maybe kind of take back as, uh, you know, as maybe something still under work, still under preparation for when it's going to have to be tested on a tougher level. That's what I think you can look at for Zeus in the top side individually. Now, with Zeus like that, I think you can look at Owner in the jungle having a relatively strong performance throughout the series. And then you can also look at someone like Faker at this event. The way that he was able to play and the stability that he had at this event, far cry from what we saw from him individually at MSI this year. Yeah, it felt like that peak level T1 where so much of it was being played through Faker and so much of it was him actually having priority on some of these picks and being able to do something not just quirky over and over obviously the Yasuo was a treat to clinch uh, this tournament so T1 we learned they can control the meta and still are capable of getting to that world class form even though it's been few and far between uh, in the LCK split their LCK brethren I know this is the one people are overreacting about the most because Gen G comes all the way over to a whole new country in the middle of a season to play two games where they get swept by top esports. So we're saying they're frauds, they're overrated, they shouldn't, they're never gonna win. The Golden Road, it's already been broken. The Golden Road is still intact. This is not part of that Golden Road. But really, what we learned, especially with some of the leaks out of Gen.G, is maybe they don't have as good a grasp of the meta as we initially thought. They've just been smurfing despite that. Yeah, shout outs to the EWC cameramen and the, and the uh, operation going on there, showing us a little behind the scenes. I think they should get fined for that one, maybe. Yeah. 
<laughs> not the best look, but yes, Gen G. Uh, a little out there on the meta, certainly one of those ones where I, I, I think missing from that page certainly was a little bit more of the Chistana identification would have been something you would have liked to have seen on that list and the, where the, the meta was. For Gen G, people are completely overreacting to me on this type of one because it is all the Gen G haters. It is the doom and gloom type of mentality with this Gen G. One that arguably to me, they have more than fought a slip up type of situation. We talked about it heading into this event type of thing where they had last lost in February. February! That's how far back you gotta go to find and blemish on these guys' record. Uh, dropping this type of series, these two quick games at this event and, and in the fashion that they did, sweeping it under the rug and moving on. If you are Gen G, you are, uh, you know, uh, dismissing this completely from your mind and re-hitting back into the pavement, back onto the runway that you've been doing at, on the, through the LCK so far this summer. The preface, leading up to this whole event was basically every team is getting a pass and an asterisk to this optional for fun or for cash event that we're getting and there was such a quick turnaround for all of these teams i don't care that the asian teams they don't have as far a flight to go to get here it doesn't matter you're completely uprooting your entire schedule and routine in a matter of like 48 72 hours for a lot of these squads so it was going to be a given that not all of these teams were going to be playing at their best level. Uh, yeah, if your expectation is to perform and execute at that highest of level, moving away from home, any type of situation, yeah, sure, maybe you might say, yeah, it's not that far away. It's certainly far away from the bed in your home, right? Your home bed, all these types of things that you are familiar and, and comfortable with that keep you in that routine to then perform at your highest level when it's required. That wasn't there for me, for a lot of these teams, as you and said. And a usually, lot of MSI and Worlds, you get a week, two weeks, you're acclimating to these new settings, these new environments. I feel like these guys probably unpack their suitcases in the hotel, and then they're down on stage playing their first matches. I don't even think they unpacked. I don't even think they brought a suitcase, man. You could bring a pair of extra shorts in your, uh, you know, carry-on bag. They got all the team push. uniforms that got brought for them. You don't even need to bring clothes. There it is. There it is. Problem solved. For Gen G, I think a lot of people taking way too much trying to use this as ammunition to, to say that, you know what, the chokers, the international success, it's not there to dismiss what we already saw at MSI this year, to dismiss all those domestic championships from this team. I won't stand for it. We're moving on. We're hitting the refresh button on Gen G. Other side, we shouldn't be overreacting about Gen G whatsoever, but hey, credit where credit's due, top esports. Had a great run. It started with the Gen G uh, 2 0 that I don't think anyone was expecting, especially the sheer domination that they had uh, in some of those sets. And Top Esports, you're not calling this redemption from MSI because this is not nearly the same high stakes, but carrying over, they've had easy competition so far in the LPL that they've dominated, but proving here that they are legit. And for me, the one thing I'm learning from TES from this event is that Cream can be that world-class mid laner that this squad needs. And that's a big development for Top Esports, getting that type of comfort and you know confidence in his gameplay to make a statement like that for this team because that is an X factor that they did not have at MSI. You were talking about Jackie Love. You were talking about what 369 could do up in the top side. Cream ever wasn't really that factor. He was something that you hoped could stand up against the test of the other top mid laners that you had at MSI. This is one of those ones that maybe you can start thinking about how lethal he could be as an option for this top esports team, the way that he played throughout this MSI. You're right, it is not redemption. Uh, sorry, excuse me, this EWC for MSI. That's, that's what you're trying to get the redemption for. It's not. It's not going to equate out to that type of one for top esports, but it does show that even despite not necessarily the strongest group throughout the fearless draft portion of the LPL split, we do see top esports as this top tier option once again, and they have provided this next little level up, a little bit of a boost that does have you feeling hopeful for them as you move into this later part of the season. And I think it kind of reaffirms, reassures, because after MSI, people were hesitant to even put TES as the number two team in the LPL, wanted to slot JDG ahead of them. They didn't want them being compared to T1 in the same tier list, in the same category. But now 
Got a best of five finals against them, and yeah, Top Esports absolutely deserves to be in that same category. I, I'm fully on that page, and what we saw from them at this event, and, and where we didn't need this tournament to know that, by the way, but some people. Uh, yeah, it, it just helps us know it a little bit sooner, a little bit more. So seeing them against some of these international competition, getting this type of far compared to well. We'd have to probably go another week or two of the LPL to have this type of confirmation, this type of boost in where you feel about top esports. And their other LPL buddies, BLG, much like Gen G, a little harder to actually learn or take anything from this event. At least they played one extra game because they managed to take one off of T1. And just like TES, you know, competitive series against T1, but really all you're learning is that T1 and Faker continues to absolutely own the LPL inside and out in any tournament that's international and has the title world in it. That's it. <laughs> and they got to rename MSI next year to the Midseason World Invitation. Well, uh, for T1 fans, it's it's kind of split because that's unfortunately a very small list of things that you'd have to be qualifying in. But number two, those are the ones that matter, is at least one of them, is the way that you can look at that type of situation. Uh, for BLG, this was clearly, to me, one of those ones where, yes, you saw uh, maybe a little bit less power, a little bit less preparation than we are prepared for them in the LPL and where that standard is going to be. But when you look at how they played against T1 and you reference back to the MSI series for T1, it absolutely plays better into the hands of T1 in the sense of understanding that, yes, this is the T1 that you mentioned can dominate, can crush the LPL on command. That's the type of T1 that put back this pushback against the BLG, a BLG that very much had the commanding hand at MSI against T1 when they were struggling, when then it was sloppy for the T1 organization. Good punch back from T1 in this situation, uh, hyper-focusing in on that individual matchup. And obviously the biggest uh, surprise of that series to me at least was T1 out team fighting BLG, even when they seem to be having, uh, being at the disadvantage in some of these fights. That's peak T T1 being able to do that because BLG does exactly that to every squad in the LPL. So getting a taste of their own medicine was the biggest surprise there. But just like Gen G, losing one series right away, not so far away from anything related to panic with BLG. They're still the best team in the LPL. They're still absolutely terrifying a matchup for any other team in the world. Now we get to the big learnings, the most important things from this Mickey Mouse tournament, as we love to call it, and that is North America versus EU, Mark. I'm, I'm noticing a trend, obviously. Uh, we'll start with Team Liquid. They get some revenge against Fnatic. They have a bang. Not revenge. They beat them again. There's a bit of a banger uh, game three. But what I learned about TL from this tournament is, I, I'm scared to say it, Mark, but I'm hopeful for this team at an international event. And that is terrifying to say because they might have had the best chance of beating T1 at this whole event. I don't know how they're doing it. I don't know how they have found a way to find the rain and the sunshine and everything to grow in the LCS, uh, you know, uh, unhospitable region for this type of growth. It's happening. It's happening at Team Liquid. We are seeing it continue what we have talked about. You can go all the way back worlds last year and remember how you felt about the experience how everything went some of the disappointment and where you needed to see things pick up from in this next split spring comes around you get the msi ticket you get all that type of growth and we talked about how different it looked compared to the world's event just a few months prior and how their growth had gone and look where we are just another couple of weeks later talking about team liquid at this event showing once again that it is still pushing that sky limit. I think the, the craziest thing from this T1 series, it's not them flipping a Baron to lose the entire series and then OT getting caught out. That's not surprising at all. What was surprising in this series is they were out maneuvering T1 around the map. They were getting macro, uh, you know, turret trades and just overall full five man units around the map. It was cleaner than T1 at times. And I don't know if we've ever said that in the history of the LCS. 
and I want the Team Liquid team to look at this as not like we are coming away from this event with a brand new, you know, full building kit, full Lego to go home and have fun. You're coming back with just that, you know, that specific Lego brick, that one piece that you needed to change your build, to make something special and make it yours. That's how I feel it's got to be from Team Liquid coming away from this event because you are taking a little bit of that positive, a little bit of success, but you are getting that reaffirmation that this is the right path, that we are growing, we are improving in the ways that matter. And the ways that matter when we are facing off against our international competition, getting once again the nod over Fnatic. So Team Liquid, what we learned from this event is confidence is key because you see Yawn and APA in particular going forward and being confident even against t1 in a matchup that we a rematch from something like msi and they're not you know shying away from going up against these big teams and they proved that they could compete so everybody else in the lcs should be writing it down and taking a mark from what tl has done at this event and then obviously earlier in the year at msi when you're looking at the eu side of things you might not be feeling quite as good obviously fanatic loses again they've been in a slump in the lec so that wasn't too surprising but our freshly embarrassed FlyQuest squad coming in and giving G2 absolutely everything they could handle and following that up by getting absolutely smashed by top esports. And right now, you're feeling better about the LCS than the LEC. That has to be the way that the takeaway is coming through this event. You're fanatic, you're the only thing, the silver lining that you're hoping from this event is, well, what happened last time they got beat by an LCS team and then returned back to the LEC? Yes, it was an uptick in performance. It was the revenge tour. So we got two until, and a half weeks of good fanatic coming up. I was going to say, until it crashed out into this current slump form that we are seeing from them. So that's the, the worrying part about trying to get yourself hyped up in that silver lining sense. And then for G2, I think across the board, this was a relatively sloppy event. Even from Caps, who is your Mr. Reliable, Mr. Dependable, Mr. Mr. Everything for G2, it wasn't there for this team. And I think in the FlyQuest series where it really did come down to, you know, I think Whippo having a relatively rough series for FlyQuest and Caps finding just enough of a difference maker to make them through, you're not feeling as strong as you should be about the LEC. And honestly, it felt like it was another Dr. Mundo heist in that third game against FlyQuest. I don't know. Maybe there's a different champion. Maybe FlyQuest is coming away with that. But the fact that people were so low on FlyQuest as they're the consensus third best team uh, in the LCS right now. And I know G2 is not in the best form right now at the top of the table in the LEC. But by the end of summer... Coming to Worlds, you're going to be talking about G2 probably as the best team. So the fact that FlyQuest is giving them all that they can handle, it's worrying signs for Europe, I would say. I, I'm leaning definitely more so to the worried side. I think there is still, uh, unfortunately for the LEC, not a positive in your sense, but a positive for the LCS and checking in with FlyQuest's performance. As I said, criticizing Gwipo up in the top side, but it's Masu and Busio down in the bottom lane, holding it down and showing a little bit more lethality, a little bit more of that skill that we know that they have on the international stage is something a little bit different. Yeah, I think that's, if you're looking, what did we learn from FlyQuest from this event? It's that Masu and Busio learned a lot from MSI. We've, they've already seen them look much better in the LCS through a couple of weeks, but now seeing them match up against uh, G2 and the growth is even quicker than I probably thought after getting smashed at MSI. I think a little bit for them, they were benefited by this being, you know, the EWC. This is not the world. This is not MSI. It's not coming with that same type of pedigree, that same type of, of you know, admiration that everybody for has them. for the event. Exactly. Not, not nearly the same type of pressure type of situation. And we know with the LCS, when the pressure is out the room, <laughs> we're the region to look out for, baby. If you had a no-stakes tournament, uh, the LCS... Like, you can't be eliminated. The LCS might win every game. <laughs> uh, only LCS things. But yes, this is the what you're seeing from FlyQuest at this event was the bottom lane showing up and showing out was the more important thing, I think, for a lot of people to get that extra confidence, get back on board the FlyQuest train.
Honestly, if I'm Cloud9 sitting at home watching MSI and then this, seeing Team Liquid and FlyQuest put up decent showings, I'm going, get us to Worlds because I feel like we can compete with these guys if Team Liquid and FlyQuest are doing it. Absolutely, and this is only better for looking at the remainder of the LCS split ahead of us and what type of competition we're going to have. Because this should be a Team Liquid that is coming back and saying, we are the spring champions. We are the ones representing and showing out well internationally now, providing that level of competition. They got to go in as the big dogs. You got FlyQuest that is maybe feeling themselves, feeling a little bit of that resurgence, having extra confidence in the bottom lane and how they're able to contribute and what type of pop-off they can have. Cloud9, you got to bring it. You got to be this super team that everybody has talked about. You got to, you know, deliver on the potential that is there for the names on this roster. And you got to get a little bit lucky, I think, too, given how good we have seen from a FlyQuest, from a, sorry, excuse me, from a rising FlyQuest and from that top dog in Team Liquid. And that last thing on the Europe side of things, the way they save this, or it looks better, if G2 and Fnatic in this form just turn it on a bit and end up winning... Uh, these playoffs to close out. You're not feeling great about the LEC going to Worlds. If SK and BDS continue at the level that they're at and they're maybe the top two seeds or fighting for those top two seeds for Worlds and all of a sudden G2 slips into a third seed heading to Worlds, then it feels like the whole level of Europe has been raised up. That's a different story. If that's what comes through, if that's what we've been asking and talking about and questioning, whatever happened to dethrone G2 or a fanatic, the old King El Classico at the very top and have a legitimate other squad run at that front in the LEC, BDS and right now the hot hand of SK are looking promising, are looking like options that you could have. And yes, that is the one way to spin this, the one way to identify and look at it and maybe examine things in that different angle and say, ah, I've got this one figured out, is that it is Fnatic and G2. Yes, the struggles are maybe a little bit for real, but maybe they're not the shark that you got to be looking out for in the ocean. It is that BDS. It is that SK Gaming lurking out deeper water. And truthfully, if G2, I think they need to have a domestic loss to kind of have to look inwards ahead to a world championship and say, okay, there actually is a lot of things that we need to work on even domestically. So if you're EU, you should be cheering for SK and BDS to be running through some of these gauntlets in summer uh, and the season finals at the end. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you, beautiful people.